Hi, I'm Will Webb, and this is Why You Should Watch. In this episode, we're discussing Francois Truffaut's 1959 film, The 400 Blows. Tes parents disent que tu mens tout le temps. Tu mens, je mens de temps en temps, quoi. In this classic coming-of-age film, young Antoine bunks off school and roams around Paris, returning home to a chaotic domestic situation that he yearns to escape. Joining me for this conversation is Tara Krem, a film composer whose previous credits include documentaries Seahorse and March for Dignity. Tara brings her personal journey into cinema to this discussion, making for a fascinating conversation. Hi Tara, how are you doing? Hi, I'm well, thanks. How are you? So well. Uh, and the thing I left out about that, uh, about you there in that potted intro, is that we've actually worked together on a project as well, which is how I know you. So uh, me and Tara did uh, something I think that's probably quite different to a lot of the rest of your work. Um, a very like uh, dodgy bit of like kind of sampling led uh, electronic music for a fake BBC magazine show for a short film. Uh, last year, which was a very fun project and very different for me too, I should say. We're talking today about like an absolute all-time classic movie, much more so than some of the other stuff that we featured here. Uh, but it's great to kind of touch on this, these real classic stuff, uh, which is 1959 Francois Truffaut's The 400 Blows, which I'm reliably informed is actually a really badly translated title. Uh, it's not so much as these like hits that this kid gets. Uh, in French, I think the title means more something like The 400 Tricks like the tricks that are played on him, I guess. So we've got this kind of classic to talk about, and it's actually one that I had never watched. I knew very little about going in. Um, despite all the movies I've seen, somehow I've managed to leave this off the list. And it'd be great to kick off by talking about how you came to the movie and, and kind of, was it a recommendation for you? Was it one of those like thousand and one films to watch before you die type things? No, I was really lucky. I had uh, I did French A level when I was young, <laughs> and um, it wasn't going very well. My French A level was hard. It was really hard, and we did uh, we had, but it improved when, along with uh, learning about the road system and the wine of Burgundy, <laughs> we um, learned the films of Truffaut, and it was just this fantastic syllabus which totally turned me on to film, and we. So as I think what we've got to do is we've got to watch the films, all of his films pretty much, um, in with subtitles and then wrote about it in French. And there were themes like, I remember the, the sort of exam themes were things like the role of children in the films of Truffaut or the role of women in the films of Truffaut, things like that. And I, I don't actually um, remember, it, it was just part of the syllabus, so we would have watched that. And um, yeah, totally, it saved my French A-level because I suddenly, <laughs> suddenly loved French and kind of studied French really through French cinema. And I used to, it just completely turned me on to film. And I used to go, um, there used to be, that every man cinema in Hampstead before it got all posh used to be this kind of run down, lovely little repertory cinema. And you used to be able to go there and have a cup of coffee and a piece of cake and watch double and triple bills French on a Monday afternoon. I don't know, I'm not sure if I was at school or if I had the afternoon off, I'm not sure, but it was you very okay, like Antoine and his friends do. Yeah, yeah. That's right. I was channeling Antoine when I was when I was uh, going over there to watch. Yeah, double and triple bills. So that's that's how I got into. That's how I got to watch the film. A triple bill is a serious bit of film going. I've never done a triple bill. I've done double bills, um, and I've sometimes played with the idea of going to the Prince Charles Cinema in Leicester Square to see their like five film overnight screenings, uh, but I cannot. I don't think I could do it. I don't think I could sit still for yeah. it. As much as I like a long movie, I think five different movies is too much for me to get in. Yeah, I do. I think the, the triple bills were quite a rare thing. Double bills I did often, but I remember once going to the, what was the was one in King's Cross for a long time? The Scala. Yeah, Scala the Scala. Cinema. I remember doing an all night there, but yeah, that was kind of m mayhem really. Everyone was just smoking at the back when people were falling asleep in the aisles. That was, yeah, I think I kind of went there late or something. It was, it was too much, five films in a night. The, uh, the Scala's famous for that stuff, isn't it? Um, the, I remember going to a talk with one of the guys who ran it, uh, Nick Powell, who unfortunately died last year. And um, he said the worst thing that they had happened there was that one guy just died in the back row during an overnight. Because uh, it was in an area that was very run down in London at the time. Obviously, King's Cross now is like so gentrified. Um, 
but it was very run down. So a lot of homeless people would come in and basically use it as a cheap or even just like if they snuck in a free place to sleep. Uh, and yeah, this old guy just died in the back row. So yeah, what a way to go and, and a real risk for a, for a five hour screening at any rate. And I think it's it's lovely that you, you found this through A-level language. I mean, um, just thinking about it as like an example of French language, there's so much like kind of playful and jokey colloquialism in it as well. I can't imagine how that would have been. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah. I noticed that like uh, Antoine's stepdad, I, I thought it was his dad originally watching the film, but apparently it is his stepdad, right? He says he gave him his name at some point. And I don't know if there's like something that I'm missing in the, the French individually in it. Um, but I believe he's his stepdad. Yeah, uh, he's his stepdad. And he is like this real clown character who like has these recurring kind of bits that he's playing. Uh, and I'm assuming some of that stuff just goes right over my head as someone who's not a, not a French speaker. So yeah, that must have been yeah, really. Yeah, um, a lot of eye-opening. slang. Yeah, and I think we, I think that was part of what we learned as well. I seem to remember. I mean, that was another thing we used to write down these bits of slang. I think while watching. And uh, there's also like this this corollary to that. I guess there's quite a lot of like classical French in it. There's love poetry that they study in class. And one of my favorite things about it is that Antoine um, becomes very briefly like obsessed with Balzac, the uh, the French author, and lights a shrine to him in his little flat, uh, oh. which is, I think, a really funny touch. I know it's really, really sweet. He he like there's one brilliant uh, little shot of him, him and his best friend. I mean, he's got this lovely best friend called Rene, and there, it's really a, a great friendship. They're very loyal to each other, and they really help each other, don't they? And they're and uh, this shot, I don't know if you remember, where he's just lying in Rene's, on Rene's sofa uh, with either a cigarette or cigar in his hand <laughs> with this huge Balzac book. And he's like this, yeah, 14-year-old. Yeah, it's absolutely fantastic. And then, yeah, doing the shrine to him. And uh, this really, really sad scene where he, he plagiarises Balzac by mistake because he, he's, he's just absorbed Balzac so much that he... Un, by mistake, completely writes an essay with with all of the words from Balzac. We should probably wind back and actually explain the plot very briefly for those oh, watching. Yeah. Uh, there isn't really much of like a direct high stakes plot in it. I mean, some high stakes stuff happens, but it's kind of like a random series of events type plots. And that's one of the things that marks it out as part of the French New Wave. This is like one of the ori- initial films of that film movement uh, where we're watching these black and white, almost verite movies. Uh, in a way that I think to a modern viewer can feel a bit um, like unnoticeable. I noticed there was lots of like whip pans and shaky camera kind of following the kids. And that's these style touches that feel really ubiquitous now, but back then were like these shattering, like big new ideas to bring into drama narrative film in particular. And um, so we, we kind of follow Antoine through his daily life and that's essentially the plot of it. Uh, he essentially gets into like a couple of scrapes that get bigger and bigger stakes as they go on, uh, which kind of climaxes in him ultimately entering the justice system, having uh, stolen a very bad idea. He stole a typewriter, as one of the kids at the Borstal tells him afterwards, uh, because they have serial numbers, right? So they're really bad to steal. But yeah, so he has Rene, who's his best mate, uh, who seems to live in very different circumstances to him. His parents are also quite uh, absent from his life. He has a rich dad and his mum is apparently deliberately avoiding him and apparently her son. Uh, But he lives in this big gaff, which is where Antoine, when things get too hard with his parents, goes and like hides out there uh, with René as well. And they also bunk off school a lot. So that's a lot of the structure of the film is like them not going to school or uh, getting into trouble at school and then deciding to avoid it the following day. And notably near the start of the movie, they go to a fun fair, which kind of kicks off the plot as much as there is one um, because he sees his mum kissing another man on the street. So yeah, it's, it's this kind of story of these kids who are very much adrift and very loose uh, from society really. But I was touched by that central performance from uh, Jean-Pierre Laud, I think is his name, uh, which is this lovely and kind of sensitive performance. You know, he plays this boisterous kid who's trying to like construct his own identity, but he's always zipped up tight in his coat, kind of grim and uh, very closed in and quiet prone to bursts of anger and then opposite him is Rene who's much more of a kind of fast talker and uh, I don't know maybe more of the thinker of the group hard to mm. say mm. yeah and um, yeah I agree the performance of uh, Jean-Pierre Leo is just um, fantastic and you, do you know the story that he worked he sort of 
he worked with him in successive films after this one. So he kind of took, um, I, I mean, I think he was an actor. Oh no, he wasn't an actor. No, he never acted before, but his mother was an actor. Um, and so he kind of, you know, he wasn't unknown to the business, but he, he'd never acted before. And uh, Truffaut found a load of, uh, it took him a long time to find him. And uh, there's actually, if you look online somewhere, there's some fantastic, there's a fantastic um, clip of the first audition with um, the actor. And uh, he's like, oh, you're, you're a bit old to be playing a, uh, oh, I think maybe they changed. They must have changed the age because I think Truffaut says you're a bit old to be playing a, a twelve-year-old, or is it the other way around? You're a bit old to be. No, I think it's you're a bit old to be playing a twelve-year-old. I think that's it. That way I around. Think they, I can't remember if they actually say his age in the film. Um, the the fourteen bit I've just found online. I think that that might just be the age of the actor in it. Yeah. I think so. So maybe they just made him a bit older for the, but I think he was supposed to be playing a 12 year old. He said, oh, you're a bit old. And he said, oh, I'm quite sure. And he's just really kind of a bit cocky. But, uh, and also like he says, oh, you wanted someone a bit mischievous, didn't you? And he was like, yeah, I've come off school to be here. So he's really like the character, but, but you're right. He's not just a bit, uh, you know, cheeky and a bit, uh, he's also quite sensitive. And you can see that in a lot of the ways that he wants to relate to his mother and and the way he relates to his friend. And yeah, I think you're right that his friend's the kind of planner, the plotter. Yeah. He's always, um, uh, Antoine's always getting, like they're all naughty at school. But, so they're, they're in school together and they're always playing tricks on the teachers, which is loads of great little moments where basically the adults in this film are all either a bit stupid, yeah. a bit foolish, or neglectful, or cruel too. And the kids are the ones that we're, we're sympathetic with. And um, yeah, that bit where he's, uh, you know, at the, at the start of the film where he's basically, he gets in trouble. He's the one who gets in trouble all the time, even though it's the other kids. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it starts off with them passing around a pin-up calendar, basically, like, a, with a dirty picture on the front. And uh, he just happens to be the one who has it in his hands when the teacher turns around and sees him. And, uh, yeah, he writes uh, graffiti, in fact, on the wall to, to that effect, uh, which then gets him into uh, having to write lines, which is the reason why he sneaks off to the fun fair because he hasn't done it. Yeah, there's always yeah. something, like you say, it escalates, doesn't it? There's always yeah. something. And it's so little, it starts so little, but... He's like, and it's always the adult's fault as well. Like, um, you know, he can't, well, it's not always the adult's fault, but like he can't do his homework of those silly lines because his mum tells him to go out and buy flour. Um, you know, there's always something that it's not really his fault about, but he gets, it gets him in worse and worse trouble. Yeah, he's, he's kind of like a victim of circumstance throughout the movie in lots of ways, not least of which is kind of the circumstance we see him in at the start, even before all the bad stuff happens. Yeah. Um, and it's notable that like his, there's not really much love lost between him and his parents. Um, but it's interesting about the depth of that performance because so he sees his mum kissing this guy and his first reaction is more like, well, I might get told off because of that, because I've seen her do that. Uh, yeah. But then he points out to Rene, who, who mentions this to him, well, she's not going to tell me off because then she'd have to tell dad why yeah. she's telling me off so it's not i'm gonna be fine and then it's this real kind of like um oh i'm fine with my mates and then later on in private with his dad he, his dad brings up the mum, and he's kind of goes quiet and yeah. he's not really able to talk about her and it has kind of affected his relationship a bit so it's quite sensitive i yeah. felt like it was um a really rich portrayal of a kid's kind of internal landscape as well he has this fantasy of like going off to the beach or to the river and becoming like a fisherman yeah. um, it's like that we don't think he's ever actually really done there certainly seems to be no evidence of that um but is i almost implicitly is what he's trying to do at the end of the film when in this kind of really famous kind of final shot he's just on the beach and then the, the camera freeze frames and pushes in on him amazing amazing shot and like you say like at that time that was really uh, unusual to have like that freeze frame at the end you, you wouldn't yeah. have I mean that's come a lot since but at that time it was quite um, unusual wasn't it that kind of filmmaking well even the editing style of the film is very different to if you watch like at the same time I mean like 
my French cinema knowledge is not great. Yeah, if I think about comparing it to like, like Au Revoir Les Enfants, right? Which is like three mm. hours long, lots of dissolves. Uh, and although it covers kind of similar emotional and territory, like talks about crime and stuff like that, it feels a lot more stately in terms of how it's made. Yeah. Whereas this yeah. feels as chaotic as the events that are occurring in it. Yeah. Um, and even down to the opening, which is kind of shot out of a car, looking up at the Eiffel Tower, but with all these kind of buildings constantly going by and getting in the way of it. Which yeah. I think tells you something about the philosophy that's behind the filmmaking. Yeah, it's really fresh. I mean, it was that um, he it was that whole new wave thing, wasn't it? The French new wave that he was such a part of, and which felt fr- and it still. I mean, I think it still looks. Obviously, it's it's in black and white, and it feels in some ways like the music's very much of its time, mm-hmm. but it still feels fresh to me. Those a lot of this film. Yeah, there's a bit in it when he, he goes to this fun fair visit early on and he gets into one of those contraptions that kind of spins around and sticks you to the wall with the force of the spin. And that's shot in a way that I think you still probably wouldn't do now, even necessarily, um, where it's very dizzying. He's pinned, he's like rolling around inside it. I mean, I don't think maybe health and safety wouldn't allow you to do it anyway, full stop. Um, but yeah. it really, you can't tell what's going on in some respects in, in sections there. And that feels very fresh even now. Now you mentioned the music um, and I, I know that you're, you know, you're a composer, so it'd be great to talk to you a bit about the music that's in it, because mm. it's interesting. It starts off almost waltzy, you know, it has this kind of waltzy energy at the start. Yeah, I mean, as I said, you probably, I mean, if this was made now, this kind of film, I don't think would have uh, the music that it does, but uh, it's not, yeah, it's kind of got these very, like you say, waltzy, kind of romantic, um, very much yeah a kind of romantic feel to it very french feeling um but then at other times it is quite poignant and there's sort of solo guitar at some points um there's this sort of at the this end uh are we allowed to talk about the end you did earlier so i think we are yeah it came from 1959 so if they haven't watched it by now then yeah okay Uh, it's my rule is like if the bfi would print it on one of those flyers you get before you go in then we're allowed to talk about it yeah that's true yeah Yeah, and I think it was on the trailer as well, the end. So, um, and there's this, I mean, we'll talk about a scene in a minute, but the the way actually that sometimes music's not used is really, really interesting and then comes in and at times, yeah, it's really kind of poignant and quite sparse. And then there's also, it uses humour. So there's a lot of, even though, I mean, the story is bleak. Yeah. His life is really bleak, really, and his, you know, his home life. And there's a scene later on where he talks to a psychologist um, and you really hear the sort of how neglected he is as a child by his parents and um, his mother, especially, really. And uh, but there's loads and loads of humour, like and a lot of the humour comes out of the the sort of japes that these kids get into and the music reflects that as well so there's kind of it's almost sort of jazzy bits with the music there's a great scene where they're running off do you remember where he's yeah 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 so there's yeah this this section of the film where kind of there are these spots of light and the film gets kind of progressively darker as it goes on so at the start it's almost like comedic a lot of the time and then it gets progressively darker but about halfway through he's in school and there's this like PE class they're going jogging around Paris um, and kind of one by one, these kids who are in a big trail behind the teacher just start peeling off and kind of going their own ways. And by the end, it's just the teacher on his own who hasn't noticed that these kids are gone. And um, that's set, as you said, to this like quite jaunty, jazzy bit of music that feels very different, I think, to some of the more orchestral stuff that's in the rest mm-hmm. of it. And um, yeah, if we think about music as being like the emotional heart of a film sometimes, and it, and it can lend quite a different feeling to a moment in a, in a film, um, I think he does a lot with music, uh, Truffaut, I mean, I don't actually know the name of the um, composer of the film. Um, they do a lot with music where they are kind of reminding you that there are these spots of light in amongst this grim story. Even right down to the end, once he's in like a, a boy's home, you know, he's like mm-hmm. been put into the criminal justice system. There's almost a callback to that piece of music, this kind of jaunty thing, mm-hmm. when the boys are running out to play a big game of football and they're kind of having these chats about how they got inside. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose he's getting a new kind of camaraderie, isn't he? And the in the boys' home. It's uh, Jean Constantin, I think, Jean Constantin. He worked a lot with a, with a more well-known one. Well, I think he's more well-known, Georges Delarue, but he not on this film. This was Jean, Jean Constantin. And, yeah, really kind of a memorable tune, which is used in different white melody, which is used in different ways uh, throughout the film. 
And this was pretty much his first feature. So um, I don't think he kind of stuck everyone else in yet, as it were. Um, yeah. yeah, this was his, um, because as I said, I got completely obsessed with <laughs> Truffaut. I was like, I had a book where I wrote down every film that I went to and I wrote down his that I had to tick off. It was partly, you know, we had to watch them for A-level, but then we just, we only had to watch a certain amount, but I became completely obsessed. But actually the one, the one really, that's re there's a few that I would, that I think are really great, um, but not all of them, but this one I think is his best film. And yeah, it was his, fir it was his first feature. I don't know what age he was, 27 or something, but this was, yeah, this, this I think was the, the one that's really stood um, test of time. Yeah, he died quite young as well. He died in his 50s um, in, in the mid 80s. So he, um, which is only about 30 years, not even that, slightly under 30 years after this film. Um, but he was quite prolific during that time. The films that I know of his are Jules and Jim, which is like the other big classic um, French New Wave movie. Uh, Fahrenheit 451, which is him doing kind of sci-fi, and then Day for Night, uh, which is a film about filmmaking, so it's something that filmmakers love. Um, yeah. with Le Nuit American, I think it's called in French. Yeah. The, the, uh, the cinema rules, I remember it starts like, Le Cinema Reine, yeah. and then there's like this music, which is really lovely music, and then, <laughs> yeah. But in the heat, yeah, he loved cinema. I think for Truffaut, it's, it's a bit like with... I think the idea of like Antoine and the, and Balzac sort of temporarily saving Antoine is that it's really autobiographical, the film as well, mm. isn't it? So um, it's quite his child. He, I think he also went to reform school as well. And he was saved by Bazin, who was Andre Bazin wrote. Um, he ran the this critics magazine called Kaya du Cinema. And that was the kind of, uh, and Truffaut became a, a critic, a film critic, and was really, really um, fierce <laughs> about the films at the time that were being made, so much so that he was banned from Cannes. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But then he returned, I think it was the next year or soon after with with um, 400 Blows. So he, he kind of redeemed himself in a, by through making films. We well, you know Cannes loves the drama. And yeah, I mean, that is the other defining feature of the French New Wave, or at least the, the chunk of dudes who we usually identify with the French New Wave. Because you have this other like subset of filmmakers, these left bank filmmakers like Agnes Varda, who are making slightly mm -hmm. different work, but kind of responding to the same social things. Oh, yeah. but the thing that kind of characterizes that crowd is that they were all critics, really, before they were filmmakers. Oh. And so they're really making, um, they were big like fans of Westerns, for instance. So they're making these um, movies that are a lot more anarchic feeling than what the French establishment was making at the time. And you can really feel that come across here. I noticed that a cinema makes quite a prominent appearance during the film. Yeah. Uh, when after accidentally setting fire to their flat, instead of being punished, he's taken to the cinema. And, yeah. Um, yeah, it's That's this idyllic little moment. Yeah, that's a strange bit, isn't it? Where it's the one moment, and I, I was never quite sure if it was because his mother suddenly starts being nice to him. Is that because she knows that Antoine saw him with the other man, or is it that they really are trying for a little bit, and there's a kind of shared, there's a sort of shared moment there, or is it that the cinema it, it brings them all together just through through being cinema? Possibly that. I was never really sure which which of those scenarios, why she's suddenly nice and they do, but I suppose she's complex as well. She's not just an ogre, is she? I suppose, you know, they've all, they're all, the two parents, they, they feature much less than him, but they're not, uh, you know, she, the mother is sort of dissatisfied with her life and, um, she, you know, with the, the struggle of daily life and the stepdad is sort of wants to be closer to the mother and it's all, it's not, um, they're not without their kind of concerns as well. Yeah, I mean, if you think about I, the thing I like about like a good deep bit of writing, like a good rich screenplay, is that you can have these kind of conversations where it's like there's three possible reasons why this character did this thing, and in the end it kind of might be all of them. Yeah. And um, that, that scene is also after the first time that he runs away and stays away from home for a night, after which she re makes a really like renewed attempt to be nice to him and to kind of try and understand him. Uh, although yeah. I think he kind of sees through it. But yeah, there's no flat characters in the movie, really. Uh, there's all these kind of rich people and even the cops who kind of get involved in uh, arresting Antoine at the end of the film. 
uh, kind of have these jokes with the the prostitutes that they pick up. You know, they they're like, here's the lady's car when the when the prostitutes arrive in the early morning, uh, and then here's the coach when they're going to send them off in a bus to jail to the women's jail. So yeah, there's this kind yeah. of richness in terms of like how the characters are characterized, mm. which is um, kind of indispensable, I think, when you're talking about like a, a big character drama like that. And in terms of the stepdad, he's quite an interesting figure too because um, I kind of see him as a... The, the movie is kind of about a set of people trying to get on and kind of trying to understand life and money and the search for it is constant in the film. Yeah. And it's notable that the big source of conflict in that early section between stepdad and, and mum is all about the stepdad has to go to the races uh, to, to network to try and work his way up from being a low-level manager to being a mid-senior manager, which is his kind of big thing in life. And he's always talking about how they're going to get a bigger flat and how things are going to be better, wow. uh, which feels like it's basically as fictional as the kind of I'm going to go and get a boat and become a fisherman dream that Antoine has. Yeah, yeah. And the mother always kind of wants the stepdad to be something else, really. Yeah. She's having an affair with her manager, so maybe she just wants yeah. another senior manager life. We also never get any information as to what happened with her original relationship. Uh, mm-hmm. We don't get a sense that Antoine knows his dad at all. He doesn't come up in the story. Um, no. What you get at the end when he's talking to the psychologist um, is that his gra- he was he knows that his mother wanted to have an abortion. So... Um, and the grandmother sort of persuaded him not to persuaded her not to um so he knows that it's something like you know why don't you like your mother and because basically i can't remember the words but basically because she didn't she didn't want him um but yeah we never learn we never learn anything about who the dad was at all and it's um that conversation at the end there is like this really significant bit of character but it's almost the last thing in the movie which is quite an interesting move and that as far as I understand it, that footage is actually from the original screen test for the kid. Uh, and so that woman's voice is dubbed in over Truffos, who was interviewing him off camera. So it's this yeah. real, like, fresh bit of improv that forms the center of the character. And um, it's a really interesting, like, thing to consider that as part of, like, the creative process, too. Very rare that you get a director yeah. to do all of the backstory in improv on the first day before he's even hired the kid, and then that's the movie, you know? Yeah. I I'm, I heard something different, but it certainly looks like it certainly because I I thought it's heavily edited too. The, the version of this in the movie has got lots of fades and cuts in it, and you can hear the voice kind of coming in and out. So I think it is quite a compressed. Like I think he took out a lot of stuff that didn't fit the story. Oh uh, yeah, crafted it. Oh uh, yeah, because it was all because he um, improvised it, and apparently um, the actor had been. Apparently the actor was going to. Um, the the woman was going to be in the film but didn't turn up and so, or couldn't come or something and so Truffaut thought okay well we'll film her later and just get just um film onto one and then and then he realized how good it is just to keep the camera on the boy and it's so true like why would you want to it's such a good thing and but it yeah like you say it was kind of by accident and also to get a child like that to to um improvise Apparently he knew that was going to happen. The actor knew that um, he would be asked to improvise like a month before or something, but it's still, like you say, edited, but still really improvised. And for a boy to come up with all of that, because it feels like he's just kind of going on, going off on a sort of story. It's like, how did he come up with this stuff? Yeah. And it's, it's the importance of street casting ultimately, right? Which is how they got hold of all the boys. Uh, they were kind of, in fact, I, as far as I understand, the class of boys is all kids who auditioned for the lead role. So they oh, just wow. basically got the roughest bunch of kids they could <laughs> and sat them down to do like auditions, um, which is really funny. And, you know, it's, it's interesting working with young actors because that is still considered to be the way that you do it. Like Shane Meadows, for instance, almost mm-hmm. always does street casting for his kids. Um, and even like Bugsy Malone was largely street cast. Uh, oh, really? like that kid, Fat Sam, who's like the lead mobster. Um, mm-hmm. The oh, what's his name? He's a British director, isn't he? Alan Parker. Uh, yeah, Alan Parker, Parker walks into this New York classroom and says, "Who's the toughest kid?" And they all point to that kid, and he's like, "Okay, well, let's have an interview with him." Really? Uh, which is really funny, you know, getting that kid in these song and dance numbers. But and in fact, like the film that this reminded me most of and this is such a kind of like non-chronological thing is uh shoplifters the hirokazu koreeda film that came out in 2016. uh i think koreeda has a lot in common with 
Truffaut because you know it's all about the the interiority of these kids lives and in fact it finishes on a series of interviews where you don't see the interviewer so yeah. you know there's this classic trick that's really got like cribbed from the French New Wave sheet maybe he'd love Truffaut maybe that's why I love uh Corriere as well because yeah I, I never thought they were similar but they really are and I love them mm. both I don't know if you've seen um Nobody Knows which is like Corriere's probably his best film but also like the most difficult of Corriere's films right which, um, which one is it because I've seen lots of them and I never remember which yeah they, they are all he has like three different kinds of movie that he does right he does a crime movie he does abandoned kids and he does like um coming to terms of grief and often they're the same yeah, um, yeah. yeah he did uh Nobody Knows is about like three kids whose mum abandons them uh, and they are like left to kind of oh, yeah. around in this flat yeah it's amazing and it's really sad yeah I mean you know everything goes exactly as bad as you think it might from that plot but with that yeah. movie they, they street cast the kids i mean the youngest one in that movie is four so they really have to get a personality for that kid more yeah. than someone who's going to be able to think about what they're saying on screen and they shot it over the course of a year so they took like three month breaks each time so they'd come back with the kids older and older uh, and kind of see them across the, the gaps that are actually in the film as well but yeah it's interesting like i've never done that kind of work uh, but certainly working with kids you kind of have to come up with this box of tricks in order to motivate them to get them to understand but here in antoine you have this like very inventive child actor performance and as you say like they ask him to make up a story about the women he's trying to sleep with as this like 14 year old boy which is great yeah. there's no gap he immediately comes out with something that he's like oh yeah i went and met these prostitutes and all this kind of stuff um, yeah. which i Hope does not reflect that kid's actual experience, but it by all means it certainly seems like it does. So. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that was really bizarre, wasn't it? Because he starts off kind of giggling like a child about it. And you think he's just gonna say, I don't know, keep laughing or something, but then yeah, he gets into quite an involved story. I think he's a real he's got real imagination. He must have Truffaut must have just seen that this kid has got, you know, he's he he's quite quick minded to like one of the auditions I saw um him and his and Rene sort of doing a, an audition together, and uh, you can just see that that Antoine's uh, Jean Pierre Leo is just getting more and more kind of into whatever yarn he's telling or whatever joke he's telling, and uh, you know he really you can see that he sort of enjoys it, and he's got this imagination, and of course that changed his life. I mean that was he then became an actor, you know, and 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 did more films with Truffaut as well. Yeah, he's like in the rest of Truffaut's films, or at least a large chunk of them. He's not in Jules and Jim, which is the only other one that I'm kind of familiar with. He's he's the same character. So that I mean, I don't actually. I think this one is so far superior to the follow-ups, but he's the same. It's still Antoine Duanel in different different. Um, it's still him as a character, as an older. Ah, cool. Character. Good idea. Yeah. Yeah, that's so interesting. I can't remember what they're. He's in Stolen Kisses, Bed and Board, and Love on the Run. Oh, he's in he's in Two English Girls and in Day for Night as well. Wow. So he's in like seven of the 12 movies that Truffaut made. So he oh. really did take him on. I think he saw something of himself in him, I think. And certainly, of course, with this film, it's so autobiographical. So he had to sort of see something of himself in, in the actor, I suppose. And I'm just now realising that I saw Irma Vep recently, uh, which he is also in, playing this tyrannical French film director who used to be much more famous than he is now. So who knows who he was riffing off there. But yeah. Oh. And also Truffaut has a little cameo in this film, in the in the uh, fairground scene on that ride that you were talking about. <laughs> Truffaut got to go. Yeah, I mean, Truffaut also did do some acting, right? He was in Close Encounters. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Because he loved American cinema, didn't he? Like, he loved Hitchcock. So I think he would have been perfectly happy with Spielberg, who obviously is, like, the kind of inheritor of Hitchcock in some way. Yeah. Um, but so thinking about, we, we've talked about lots of scenes in the film already, uh, and it'd be great to find out if there's a particular scene or sequence that you would recommend to a new viewer who's not familiar with the film. Uh, so if it's someone who hasn't seen the movie before, um, hopefully something not too spoilery. But if it's spoilery, hey, it was made in 1959. It's okay. Yeah, okay, there's three, so I'm having real difficulty choosing between three. Go on, let's um, hear the candidates. Hear them, okay, I'll tell them all and then you can decide. So uh, the first one would be when they, 
it, you know, they, they play truant like more than once. And uh, there's one scene where they're just kind of getting more and more delinquent. And there's one scene where him and Rene, Antoine and Rene, are walking along with this girl, like a younger girl, and they take her to a puppet show. And I have no idea who this girl is, but I think it's probably just, they, they probably know her in the neighborhood or something. And, um, I think it's a ruse to get to spend some time, you know, they can take this girl to the puppet show. Maybe you had to have a, ch a child to get you in. And then there's just a brilliant shot of, and it must be, it must have been a real puppet show and, and non-actor kids, it's, it must be. And just this fantastic shot really of looking at the children watching this spectacle of a puppet show. And, um, and it's just all their different, different reactions. And some of them are, sort of in shock and then you see them in shock and then laughing and at one point I think you see the actual puppets but mostly it's on their reaction and there's one point where a little boy puts his uh, head on the shoulder of his friend and then there's another boy who's kind of laughing but only in only when other kids laugh so he's kind of looking at the reaction to other kids and if they laugh he'll laugh <laughs> So it kind of shows all these, all how kids at that age, I think they must be sort of four or five, how they how they interact with each other. And then you kind of, you see all this and then you see a shot of, well, you see this little scene of um, Rene and Antoine who are just sitting at the back. They might as well be smoking. <laughs> and they're kind of like two like crooks talking about how they're going to get hold of some money and who they're going to steal off. And it just sort of shows how it shows some humor. It shows real sort of compassion for a sort of child's eye view that Truffaut really had, you know, he really loved children. And also um, it also shows how far apart the two boys are from this kind of innocent life and sort of idyllic life and how they've got to actually talk about where to get some money because they're running away. So that's one. <laughs> yeah, great pick. Um, really <laughs> fascinating. And I, I hadn't really thought of that moment, but I think you're right that it totally characterizes like um, something about the film that's really special, which is just that a level of observation of like behavior and of simple mm. activities that children do. Mm. Yeah. So what, what's number two? Uh, number two is the child psychologist scene. So, um, so it's when, yeah, so Antoine is brought to this reform school and, um, well, he's be because he's stolen the typewriter. Well, the awful thing is, you can cut this if it's too spoilery, but uh, the awful thing is that he's caught taking back the typewriter. That's what's so awful. So he gets away with the theft. And it's so typical of Antoine's life that he gets, it's when he's taking back the typewriter because they haven't managed to sell it. So they have to take it back. So anyway, so he's he's caught and finally his parents kind of wash, well, they, they don't completely wash their hands of him, but they say, please sort him out, take him away, sort him out. Uh, we can't control this child. And it's just, yeah, it's this amazing scene that we've talked about really where you're just looking at Antoine and um, it's the scene where they, they would have had an actor ask the questions um, but because that actor didn't turn up as the psychologist or she couldn't come to the, the shoot that day, Truffaut asked the questions instead, which was probably a really good thing as well, actually, for Antoine, I'd imagine, uh, for the actor. And he was told to uh, that he was going to be doing this uh, improvising like a month before, but he didn't know what he was going to say. And of course, he knew his character. And so he's just asked this series of questions and all you're doing is looking at him and he's kind of fidgeting. He's like, it just shows really what his character's like, but he's a little bit, um, bit cocky. Um, he's sort of, he's got not much respect for authority, but at the same time, he's quite sensitive. He's still a child. Like when they say, what are you, uh, have you ever slept with a woman? I think they say woman, don't they? Have you ever slept with a woman? And he's and he's like he laughs and you realise then he's still this little kid, but he's in this, you know, he's he's amongst adults in the prison system. Um so it, he you kind of get a lot of his character in those in those few questions. And also it's the first time, like you said, 
that you see him, that you get this backstory. And it's just incredible that you leave that till really near the end of the film because the, the whole sort of, the plot, as you say, it's not, it's a kind of a loose plot in that it feels like it just tumbles naturally and there's no, um, you don't feel like things are put in just to serve the plot. It just happens and it happens naturally and it leads to this, these various points. Um, and this is one of the points it leads to. And so you kind of get a sense, just more of an explanation, I suppose, of his character. But you kind of know it anyway, because we've become to really know this boy over the course of the film. Um, but yeah, it's just great. It's interesting because his parents seem like kind of weirdly, like annoyed with him in ways that he maybe hasn't earned. And we're kind of like, well, why are they so... And I guess in a sense, you're then in his perspective, because I think for him, the consequences aren't so clear of what he's doing. Yeah. Uh, and then you find out this stuff at the end, like that he's stolen hundreds of pounds from, from his grandparents. And it's like, oh, okay, right. Now I understand the stakes a bit more. Yeah, like his, it's true, actually. Yeah, because we're all the time thinking, oh, he didn't do that. He wasn't that bad. He wasn't that. And actually, yeah, he did steal a lot of money from his grandma. And the grandma was the one who helped him. But there's also a really good line in it where he says, the mother says, um, oh no, the, the, the psychologist says, why don't you like, no, your parents say you lie a lot. Your parents say you lie. And he said, yeah, I do sometimes. Um, and he said, uh, and he said, well, if I told the truth, they wouldn't believe me, which is just, which is really true some of the time as well in life, you know, in where, where there's sort of unjust, the sort of injustice of sometimes where I remember kids at school, you know, they hadn't really done anything, but they were got at because, and there was one boy, like I remember there was two, there were two children in my class in secondary school. One of them was always getting the other one in trouble the whole time. And it was like, it got to the point where the teacher would say, who's done this? And this boy would go, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. So he was like, he was already saying it wasn't him. He was used to being, you know, um, accused of stuff. And so in a way, Antoine might as well steal because he'll be accused of stealing or he might as well lie because he's been accused of lying. You know, he'll, he won't be believed if he tells the truth. So he might as well come up with a good story. Yeah, and it's it's sweet too that the reason why he ends up getting in such trouble is because he doesn't dob in René, who's standing outside waiting for him when he returns <laughs> that typewriter. Yeah, yeah he, there's a pointed kind of moment when they ask him if he was with anyone. He says no, and then they said, "Oh, so you take sole responsibility for it?" And he goes, "Yeah, I do take sole responsibility for it." And it's yeah, very tough. Um, yeah, yeah. And then you had a, a a third option, was it? I mean, that those are yeah. both great, and I think um, I'm, I'm with you on both of them. But yeah, give me a third option. Okay, the third one is probably the most famous one, and it led to like one of the most amazing <laughs> sequences in all of cinema. And uh, it's also, I mean, for me personally, it's one that I've sort of remembered the most probably. And I I even wrote a piece of music, because there's no, okay, so basically <laughs> he's in um, reform school. So this is gonna be a spoiler, but you can either cut where, or you can decide. So um, he's in reform school and basically, uh, they're all playing football and he makes an escape. He's already seen that that's quite a dangerous thing to do because some other kid has come back uh, earlier, earlier in that section. Um, they say, um, they say like, the only thing worse than being in the school is escaping it and then being caught, right? Oh my God. So he already knows it's a dangerous thing to do and quite risky and quite likely that he might get caught and that it, yeah and that it would be a bad thing so uh but he does he makes this 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 uh escape under a um a fence if i'm right and the and immediately the teacher sees and starts chasing him and we've seen him with loads of people you've seen we've seen him with the boys that he's playing football with and then escapes you see him sort of start to be chased but quite quickly he's on his own and he's just running through ha having seen loads and loads of paris and the city of paris we now in a really different kind of sequence to the film just see him running across running through countryside and it's just this amazing long long tracking shot it's it goes on for quite a while and it's just silent except for his feet. And you start to see bits of the countryside. And of course, he's always wanted to, um, he's talked about earlier in the film, like we said, talked about wanting to escape and be free and, you know, uh, 
run have a boat by the sea or whatever so he's running 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 through the countryside and all you hear is just his feet on the ground and it goes on and on and on and it's just amazing the sort of shot of him you see the whole of him just running he doesn't stop at all um you see him come under a kind of bridge and then you are quite, and then um, it gets to a point where you know that he's not being chased anymore. I'm not sure how we know, um, but you just it becomes sort of clear. And then finally, there's some music comes in, and it's again this very sort of romantic orchestral music, and we see a shot of the sea, and that's like okay, so he's wanted to see the sea, and he's still a bit of away from the sea, and. Yeah, that sequence, that whole sequence, I, I loved so much that I wrote a piece of music, a uh, piece of orchestral music, in fact, years later in a in a concert about that scene. And then when he comes to the beach, then so then the music comes in, and but it becomes more poignant, the music. So it ends up with just this little melody that we've heard before, but really pared down. And um, he runs to the sea and then he turns round and we just see his face and that's where it stops. So we have no idea what's going to happen to him. And apparently in that scene, the the um, director said what, oh, no, oh yeah, the direction was just to run to the sea, turn around and look at the camera, that's all. And I remember I read this thing where they said, so what, what did it mean? What did you think, um, Jean-Pierre, what did you think about this scene when you were shooting it when you were acting it and he said oh it's a mystery and they said so you know we're thinking like does it show that he's become a man it's sort of his uh stage from the boy to the man he said it's a mystery Truffaut just told me to um uh run to the sea and look back at the camera and that's <laughs> so it's all in his face it's like the ending of Lost in Translation, right? It doesn't really matter what he's whispered to her so much as yeah. just that, that there was a whisper. Yeah. Um, sometimes I think that a certain kind of film watcher can get a little bit too uh, caught up, you know, in, in those kind of mysteries. But yeah, yeah it's, it's more about the emotion on his face there, that moment of like, well, what do I do next? Yeah. And whether or not that's something that the actor experienced or whether it's something that the character's experiencing, isn't that clear, but it doesn't matter. It's, it's the end of the movie. Yeah. And it's quite an ending. I mean, to have it at that point, just to end on this shot and it's, yeah, and he's just suddenly alone, and he really is completely alone because at that point his parents have totally uh, washed his hands. I mean, they've even said, the mother said, oh, you're not my son anymore or something, or I've washed my hands of you. That's it. So it's really... I think the the parents even split up, haven't they? Or they're, they're not with they? each other anymore by that point. Um, she says something like, it was the last straw for you or something like that. There's nothing to go back to, right? Yeah, yeah, there's nothing to go back to. So all he's got is possibly having to go back to the... But you kind of... Well, you absolutely no idea, but you've cut, there is the impression that perhaps he's escaped that forever, that school, yeah. that they haven't managed to catch him. Um, but we've really no idea, and we won't know until we see one of the sequels, <laughs> which is probably not explained anyway. I can't remember, but I'd imagine yeah. it hasn't, yeah. It's almost a hopeful ending because he's kind of gotten to this kind of imagined freedom. Yeah. Uh, but I think for an adult watching it, you know, there's this mismatch between what he feels as a child being like, yeah, I'm out and what we think about like the years and years and years ahead of him yeah because yeah that's true so for him that really is um yeah he's really free at that point you're right but we know that he's only either 12 or 14 yeah. <laughs> and that he's like what you do at that age when you're on your own in in the countryside when you should be at reform school and also um just going back to the music the music ends on a undecided note so it's or something like that so it just ends on a yeah so again you know just showing how uncertain it all is yeah it's like it's running out of steam i think that bit of soundtrack almost like the film's yeah. winding down kind of thing yeah, and, yeah slower. the scene i was going to recommend actually was the funfair scene because i think it gives you a good sense of kind of the anarchic kind of approach to the film but you've, you've chosen three whole scenes and they're all great so i'm just gonna pick one of those i think okay but you're right that is a really good scene too and it's a fun it sort of shows cinema as well doesn't it the thing. yeah you can really see the impact of it there i think more than in the rest of it because mm -hmm. i mean it's a testament to how successful the french new wave was that almost everything that they did that's revolutionary feels completely traditional now yeah you know it kind of became a natural part of film language yeah um in a way that isn't it's kind of hard it's like watching um seinfeld after you've seen friends it's like why is this good why do people like this you know? yeah 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 
So that's the 400 blows and thanks Tara for recommending the film because you finally made me sit down and watch it. It was a real, uh, a real treat for me. Yeah. And is there anything that you want to plug while you're on the podcast? Any kind of like new work that you're doing, anything like that? I'm working on uh, things that will be a while. I'm working on a documentary um, which has had lots of delays, but it will be a really interesting feature film. So um, I'm starting that and I'm also writing some songs uh based on ancient Chinese poetry. Wow. <laughs> so Ooh. one day that'll see the light of day too. That's great. Tara, thank you so much. Thank you very much. To hear more conversations on film, check out the Indie Tricks podcast. Search Indie Tricks, that's I-N-D-I-E-T-R-I-X. I know, it was 2008. Wherever you listen to podcasts to get started.